Okay, so um, chapter 10, chapter 11 is due on Wednesday this week. Chapter 13, chapter 14, these are new, and this will be due on the 28th, uh, one week from now. Today, we're going to go over a lesson on, it seems like a lot, floating point, conditionals, loops, and randoms. Sounds like a lot of stuff, but it's really not too much because um, what we're learning is more the differences between Python and Java. We learned about all of these things, how to do it in Python already. And so we're just going to be learning what is the differences with Java. Okay, so let's, let's keep, jump into that. Let me bring it up. Um, can you all see at home the, um, okay, cool. Just wanna make sure it's working okay. All right, so let's talk about floating point first. And if you remember in Java, we have primitive types and we have integers. We have um, four types of primitive data for integers. We have, um, bytes, we have shorts, we have ints, we have longs. And with Java, there are two types of floating point primitive data. We have the float and we have the double, 32 bits and 64 bits. And the key thing that I want you to remember about floating point, and this is what we learned in Python, this is not any different in Java, we know that floating point is, is, is a fixed number of bits, right? 32 bits or 64 bits. And because of that, for some certain kinds of numbers that repeat forever and ever and ever, we cannot precisely represent that number within 32 bits or 64 bits. So a number like one seventh, a number like one third that repeats forever and ever and ever cannot be held cannot be represented within 64 bits. And this is the key point that I just want to remind us of. Um, again, nothing different from Python. Now, between a float and a double, which one should you use? I would just recommend using doubles. Um, they're bigger, 64 bits. Um, there was a time when I might have recommended floating or just floats because they're smaller. But today, who cares about the size? The size doesn't really matter too much. And so double gives us more precision. And so just go ahead, use doubles. Okay, so um, the other day we learned about scanning in integers. So we could scan in an integer, we could scan in a string using next line, next int. We can use next float and next double to scan in floating point values. So if you have a scanner made, then you could just say next double. And whatever you've, whatever number you've typed in will be read in as a double. Okay. And this will also, so, so you could definitely type in a number like 1.23, but you could also um, type in a floating point as well. And so this would be the format for a floating point um, where you see this E plus four, which means times 10 to the fourth power. So, so like I said, you could literally type this into, you know, on the keyboard as you're entering it into the, the computer. Um, you could also type this into your Java code. So you could say um, double x equals 1.23. So this is also valid Java code um, as a way of specifying this scientific notation number. Okay. You could also use lowercase letters. So a little e is also okay. Let me see my mail. Oh yeah, okay. Um, and um, yeah, okay. So um, another thing 
is that there are some special numbers that are available um, to be represented. So beyond, you know, numbers, there's also the notion of infinity that can be represented within the 32 bits. So there's a very special bit pattern that um, represents the number infinity, positive and negative infinity. Now, so, so for example, if you have a really big floating point number, say the maximum floating point value that you can represent in 64 bits, the maximum floating point number plus another one of those, it's gonna to be too big. So what you have is maximum number plus maximum number equals infinity. So once, once the number becomes too big, then infinity becomes the answer. Um, so if you do infinity plus two, you get infinity. If you do infinity times infinity, you get infinity, stuff like that. There's also another number that is called not a number. Um, and it's kind of weird. Um, well, it's not weird. It's used for one divided by zero. It's used for square root of a negative number. Um, and so again, these are just, I'll call them special numbers or special values. It's just a certain bit pattern that has been defined um, for, um, to represent these special numbers. Yeah, but that. Yes, yes. But is that included? Like, what, what if the number itself isn't that big? It just has a ton of decimal points. Oh, um, if you add like the uh, one with 63 decimal points and R with 63, then how, would that still be infinity? Oh, okay. So, um, so the question was the question for everybody. Let me admit this to the person. The question was, how does this infinity work? Um, it works for very big numbers, like a number beyond the range of this. Now, if you're talking about really, um, you know, like floating point can only represent some numbers perfectly if there's, you know, if it can fit within these 64 bits. If you're saying something like 0. 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, where there's like 60 zeros. This, I mean, if we just think about what this number is itself, it's, it's practically zero. And so that would not be infinity. It would just be, actually, if we tried to do this, suppose we did something like this, where we did, um, um, one point zero e to the negative i don't know 100 right really this is a decimal number with a hundred zeros you know to the right of the decimal point very small number practically zero and if we did this and we said x is equal to this x would be zero um, so it would not be infinity because it's just because we ran out of bits. It's really be, this would be uh, the value of zero. Make sense? Okay. Any other questions at home? Just checking my chat there. What if alternatively it was like, it, it wasn't supposed to be zero, but it was just like a two point? Yeah, sure. Let's, let's continue with that. So suppose it were two point <laughs> like that, right? And again, there's a, there's a hundred zeros. Does it have to be zero? Like, can it be? Um... Oh, um, okay, sure. It could be like five. Uh, say, say we just have a bunch of fives. Like a rational number. So there's just a string that continues to infinity. Yeah, but yeah. The string isn't necessarily the same. Yeah. Okay. So, um, so let's say a repeating pattern. Okay. Five, two, six. Five, two, six. Over and over and over again. Okay. Basically, it would just round it at a certain point. Because that's all, that's what happens with a number like one third. It just rounds it. Um, yeah. Okay. 
Okay, let's move on. Oh, there's a question out here. Oh, no, it's not a question. It's just a statement. Okay, yeah, no, I know a lot of you had some technical difficulties logging on today. Not your fault at all. Okay, now um, let's look at conditional statements, if else's. Now, first off, I have three mistakes, okay? Not purpose, but by accident, but here's the Python. There are actually three errors I accidentally made when I made the notes. Can you find the three errors? Go ahead, Augusta. Uh, there's no ending in brace for the if statement. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I forgot this here and this there. So fix that up in your notes. That's one thing. Does anybody find anything else? Um, uh, two else statements. Um, two L statements, you know what? Yeah, this is actually okay in, in Java. Um, that's something I, I'm going to kind of tell you in a little bit, or I'll tell you right now. It's, this is okay. This is the translation. In Python, we had an else if. In Java, we don't have an L if, but we have, we just use two words instead. So they're exactly the same. So instead of L if, you say else if. That's that's what I have down here. So that's actually legal, but there is still one mistake that I made that I just kind of forgot. Anybody? Yeah, Gusto. There's no condition after else. No condition. Yeah, I'm missing the, this condition right here. I forgot to put it right here. So let's fix that as well. <laughs> yeah, these are typos. Um, they were just something I just forgot to put in the notes. Okay, but there's another key difference. So, so the, the yellow is my mistake, typos. The, the red is the difference between Python and Java. And there's one more significant difference the parentheses right here, they're not needed in Python. So they're optional in Python, but they're required in Java. So if you do not put it there in Java, you will get a syntax error. But other than that, it, it's really pretty much a straightforward translation. Now, of course, we also need the curly brackets because the curly brackets are the Java way of, you know, identifying what is inside of a block of code. So these two statements, one and two, are inside this block, inside the if block, whereas we indent it over here. But that's not, we, we've already seen that and kind of learned that. And so that I don't call a, a major difference um, now, I do recommend that you use the curly brackets all the time. Look at the code down at the bottom. This is dangerous code to write. In, in fact, you, you want to be careful, or, or actually this could be a bug on the part of the programmer. Because what happens is statement three is not part of the if-else block. Because there are no curly brackets, statement one is the only statement inside of the if. Okay, that's that's kind of clear. But statement two as well is the only statement inside of the else. And statement three is actually outside. And that means that regardless of the condition, statement three will always be executed, even though it might look like statement three is part of the else statement, because it's kind of like this, statement six is inside the else, and it appears like that in Python, it appears like that in Java, but in this case down here for Java, 
statement three is actually outside of this block. And this is dangerous. This is actually very, if you were writing this code, maybe you might not realize, you might, wa you might have wanted statement three to be part of the else, but it won't be from a Java standpoint. And so th the way this kind of evolves by, by accident is like this. You might write some code, you know, you say, okay, if some condition, and, and you, you're, you're writing code and you think, you know, I only have one line to write. I only have something like do, do A. I only have one line, so I don't really need the curly brackets. So you get a little lazy and you don't put them in. And then you say else, and then for the else as well, I only have one thing to do. So I'm not gonna put the curly brackets in and, and it's okay, right? You, you don't need it. Java says you don't need it. But the problem is this, maybe the next day, maybe a day later you come back and you say, oh, I forgot, I forgot to do something. Um, I forgot that, that I need another statement here. So I need to do C right here. And so you just kind of add it right there. The problem is this is gonna give you an error because uh, the problem is that this is the if, the do C is outside of that. And then you have this else that's just sitting there and you'll get a syntax error right here because it'll say, what is the if that's associated with the else? It does not associate these together. And so this is a danger. Um, where you need to be careful. And that's why my recommendation is when you're writing code, just don't be lazy and put it in the brackets all the time. So even though you know you only need, you only have one statement, go put these curly brackets in anyways, because then if a day later you say, oh, you know what, I forgot, I need to add another statement here. You just add in the other statement and everything will just be fine. Your code will work kind of the way you wanted it to work. And you won't end up with this accidental error here. Yeah, hey, I know everybody um, that I just let in, I know a lot of you have been having trouble logging in because of Schoology and stuff like that. I'm gonna hopefully have this recorded so that you'll be able to just replay this all. Okay, so that's uh, the if else. Now let's talk about Booleans. Booleans, you know, we have to have some sort of Boolean right here. So let's talk about that now. The only difference between Java and Python or Python and Java, uh, instead of an and, you say and and. Instead of an or, you say bar bar. Instead of not, you say exclamation mark. Now you have to be very careful. Um, if you, if you type and in Java, you'll just get a syntax error. And that's, that's easy to find. But please remember that it's not a single ampersand, it's a double ampersand. Because there is some meaning in Java with a single ampersand, and it's not a logical and. Um, so be very careful. It's, it's, it's two of them, not one of them. And Java will not complain about a single ampersand. If, if I just type a single one here, it'll be just fine, but it probably won't work the way you thought it would work. And you'll be debugging it all day. And then you'll realize, ah, oh, I forgot to put two of them there. So just really remember, you must have two of them, not one of them, okay?
And that goes with the, the bar as well here. So no single ones, always back-to-back -back doubles. So you see here, Python to Java, Python to Java, Python to Java. Pretty straightforward. Any questions on, on any of this at home? Yeah, Julian, yeah, that's right. These, these are... Um, these are legal operators. They're called bitwise um, operators, but I'm not going to talk about that. You don't have to worry about that. All right, let's jump to while loops. Moving on. You'll notice that this is actually very, very much like Python. And, and it's so easy that, you know, this is really the only thing you have to remember differently. The, the keyword whiles is exactly the same. You need to put parentheses around the condition, otherwise you get a syntax error. And then you have your statements inside of the block. So that, that's a while loop in Java. Now, all of this below is just gonna be reminders from Python. You know, you start off always having to initialize the condition variable up at top. Then you have you know, some sort of condition upon which you loop. That's right here. And then somewhere inside of the loop, you're gonna be updating the condition variable so that ultimately you stop looping. Those are the three steps for your while loop. Now, going back to floating point, we have to also be very careful because floating point is imprecise. Remember, that's how I started off this lesson today. So be careful. Um, let's look at this little piece of code and you need to fix up an error again. There's an error in your notes. So let's start with that. Right there, that should be a greater than one, not a less than one. Okay, so let's examine this code. Floating point is 11 divided by 10. That's equal to 1.1. Okay, if 1.1 is bigger than one, which it is, then we subtract 0.1 from that. Okay, so let's do that. 1.1 minus 0 0.1 is equal to 1.0. So then we loop back up here. Um, is 1.0 bigger than one? No, it's not. It's not strictly greater. So then we do not loop again, or so we think. But remember, this is the key point. Floating point is not precise. And so maybe, maybe it's actually 1.00001. Maybe it's 0.99999. We really, we don't know unless, unless we actually experiment, we won't know which of these two values it will be. So in one case, the top case, it is actually bigger than one. And so it actually will repeat the loop one more time. But in the other case, it's less than one and it won't repeat the loop again. So this is a prime example. If, if you try it out on your computer, um, it'll be interesting. Does it, does it repeat two times or does it repeat only one time? Okay. Any questions? Any questions at home? Okay, let's move to the last topic, which is random numbers. Remember that in Python, there's no such thing as a true random number generator. And so we have these libraries that create pseudo random numbers for us, kind of fake numbers. Java has the same thing. Java has this thing called the random class. And this contains the methods to create random numbers for us. Now it takes two steps. So let's look at the two steps of how to create random numbers in Java. Step number one is that we create a generator object. And I'm gonna highlight the word generator. 
because it, it's only, it's not making any numbers yet. It's just the machine or the object that will create the numbers later on. So we need to do that first. Once that generator has been created, then step two, we can use that object that we just made. We can call a variety of methods on it to create the random numbers. Okay, so now let's break that down. Uh, step one is right here. How do we create the random generator object? Remember in Java, the key word is new. We do a new random object, a new turtle, a new string, a new scanner, right? So this is how we make ran, uh, objects in Java. We're saying that I have this variable rand, which is of type random, and I'm creating a new random object. Now, in one case, I don't need an input. But in this other case, I'm showing that you could supply an input to the random object. And so what does this number do? What does two do? What it does is it provides what's called a seed. And I think the way to think of seed, another way to think of it as a um, starting point. So within my sequence of random numbers, it's gonna, when I say two, and, and two is not a special number. It, it could be whatever number you like. It could be your favorite number, five, 10, 15, whatever. But it represents a starting point. And therefore, if the starting point has been defined, then all the subsequent random numbers will be um, predictable. You'll be in that same exact sequence. And so that's kind of nice, especially when you're creating, you know, some code that you're testing out. You could provide a seed so that the randomness is very predictable and you know what's coming up next. Okay, so that's the idea of a seed. So once we have the object, then we could actually start generating numbers. And this is step two, where we use any of these methods, next int, next double, next Boolean to get an integer, a double, or a, a random Boolean. Now with the next integer, we can also supply an input to it. And when we do it, we get a number from zero, starting from zero up to, but not including that number. For example, if I did rand dot next int 10, it will generate a random number between zero and nine. I just use next int all by itself. It generates a number from negative 2 billion all the way up to positive 2 billion. It generates any random 32 bit integer. Okay. Uh, if I use next double, it will generate a floating point number that is a number from zero to one, not including the one. So if I wrote that out mathematically, includes the zero, does not include the one. Okay. So let's look at how we use this now. Suppose I want to roll two dice. So step one, I need to create my random object. So I make a new random generator. Step two, I want to generate a number from one to six. But if I look back here at my methods, next int generates any random integer, and I, I don't want that. Next int with the input 
always starts from the number zero. So what I'm gonna to have to do is I'm gonna do the following. I'm gonna use next int six to generate a random number anywhere from zero to five. And then I'm gonna add one to that so that ultimately I get my number from one up to six. Okay. Any questions about that? So a lot of times you'll need to maybe do some arithmetic, arithmetic to kind of get from what next it gives you to what you actually want. Okay, so let's do this practice one together. Suppose I want to generate a random number that is either two, four, six, eight, or 10. One of these five numbers I want to generate, what would I do? One line of code. So if you're at home, go ahead and um, chat it out to me, what you think you would do for that. And I'll just kind of walk around here to see how you're doing on it here. Okay, some people are chatting it out at home. Let me look what I have here. Oh, interesting. Answers. Okay, okay. I, I see a few answers. Um, I'm looking for more answers from home. Chat it out to me if you're at home. Or if you're not sure, just give me your best guess. Okay. Okay, what else do I have here? Okay, some interesting ones. Hmm. Okay, I'm gonna just chat out, or actually I'll type it up here, some of the variety of answers I'm getting. So I, I like the variety that I see here. Okay, so I see uh, one of them is this.
Okay. Now, um, let's think about these at different levels. Now, one thing to remember is that whatever is input here tells you how many numbers you will get. So if I have a six here, it will generate numbers from zero to five. So that's zero, one, two, three, four, five, six different numbers. So if I do a next int 20 or next int 10 or next int eight, I will get either 20 numbers or 10 different numbers or eight different numbers here. Now, when I divide, when I do an integer divide by two, that could change that part a little bit. So let's kind of take each one of these one by one. So this one over here, I have numbers from zero all the way up to 19. And I'm dividing that by two. And so if I start with zero, I get zero divided by two is zero. Zero, or then I have one divided by two. And this is an integer divide. Well, actually, um, another thing is, um, is what's, what's up with this double slash? Do we have a double slash in Java? No, if both of the um, numbers are integers, it'll automatically do integer divide. Good, that's awesome. So thank you for speaking out because I can hear your voice and everybody can hear your voice here. That's cool. Yeah, so we don't really have a double slash. Um, now it's okay. Let's let's just change it to a single slash um, because it will be. Um, this is going to be an integer divide here because on the right left hand side, this is an integer on the right hand side. This is an integer. So we have integer divided by integer is equal to integer. So um, let's kind of fix this up. This is now Java code. So zero divided by two is zero. One divided by two is zero. Um, two divided by two is equal to one. So this is actually giving me numbers 0, 1, 2, all the way up to 19 divided by 2, and that's going to be 9. So this, is, this top line is going to generate a random number from 0 to 9. And if I work these other ones out too, it won't be quite right. This will be, I think, from 0 zero to four, zero, one, two, three, four. If I think about this one here, uh, the way I think about this, I, I go like this. Okay, this piece generates a number from zero to seven. And then I'm adding two to that. And so I get some random number from two to nine. So the starting value is, this, this is okay, but I could get a three, I could get a four, I could get a five, all the way up to nine. So these bottom two actually will work. So let's look at each of those um, here. So random next int zero through five, that gets me a random number from zero to four. Then I add one to it, and that gets me a random number from one to five. And then I multiply that by two, and that gets me a random number two, four, six, eight, four, ten. Right there. Okay. And and you notice the difference between these two here? Um, it's just using the distributive property. So no real difference, okay? All right. Okay, class, one last thing. Um, I wanna get you off into your, um, to lab time. But before I do that, 
I want to show you kind of one. Hold it, hold on. So I want to warn you about problem set 10. Make sure you read this sentence right there. If you haven't done problem set 10 yet, um, or, or chapter 10, this is a very important sentence. And, and what it's saying, I'll actually illustrate to you what it's saying right over here. It's saying that right here on this line, we've already created for you a scanner, new scanner. The code already does that. So what you should not do is you should not copy this line here and you should not repeat it down here. Now, your code is gonna work just fine if you do what I just did right here. Your code will work, but when you submit it up to WebCAD, it will not work because our test code is not expecting you to create a brand new scanner here. So please just, just don't do it. Um, what you could do here, uh, you don't need to do that because the scanner has already been made. So what you could just do is you could just start using it right away. You can say next int to get the next int from the keyboard. So no need to create a new one in each of the methods below, okay? All right, um, I'm gonna send you off into breakout groups just so that you can work on your own in 